Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tomas Ribeiro. James? I'm James Makepeace. Tabia. I'm Tabia. Hasba. Jardine. Uh, I'm Jordi Langer. Uh, and welcome back to another uh, Praxis Interviews. And uh, today we'll, we're interviewing uh, Kelly Stevens. Hello. Hi. Um, so for people who, um, who don't, uh, don't know who you are or what you do, uh, why don't you give us a, a small little introduction of well, who you are and what you do? Oh, okay. So I'm an actor. I've been an actor all of my life. <laughs> So um, I started working professionally when I was about 20. Um, so I've been working for just over 30 years. Um, I started off in very small scale touring um, where we literally used to go to a village in the middle of nowhere, put up the set, do a show and then drive on to the next village. So I did that for the first four years of my career. Um, I've done a little bit of television, quite a bit of television in the early days. And I suppose maybe for the last 15 years, I've been concentrating on Shakespeare. So my career's sort of concentrated on Shakespeare. So I've been, was at the Royal Shakespeare Company for a long time, the Globe on and off and the National. Um, so obviously at the moment, we're all in the COVID year. So uh, I haven't done much this year, but um, I also run a Shakespeare theatre company for learning disabled adults. So, um, oh, what's so the name? we're called Bold as Bard, and we're part of a much larger company called Ego Performance Company. You probably can see that on there. Yeah. I've, I've had so many Zoom meetings with them, I've forgotten to take it off. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Totally so, fine. But I very, I work very specifically with a group of about ten to fifteen um, learning disabled adults, and we do Shakespeare. That's great. So, um, well, um, so. Why, why did you, uh, you said that you've been an actor all your life. Mm -hmm. um, why, why did you pick this uh, industry? What, what about it intrigued you so much? Um, it's not so much that I picked it. I think it picked me. Hmm. Um, I, oh, I suppose the easy way to put it is I was a lot of trouble at school and I was going to be expelled. But I had a really, really brilliant teacher called uh, Mr. David Dalton. And he just felt that I was really frustrated and under challenged. So I was kind of forced to go to every extracurricular class there was, choir and rounders and oh, I hated it all. But one night a week I used to do drama and I suppose I just suddenly found my niche. And um, it was a place where I could express myself. It was a place where I really felt that I fitted in. Um, and I guess the rest is history. I, um, I auditioned for the National Youth Theatre when I was 14. So I started with the National Youth Theatre then and then went straight into drama school when I was just 18, so. Damn. So it kind of picked me. And mm -hmm. I suppose the thing is, you know, you're never really sure you're ever gonna get work. I mean, I didn't have an agent for the first two years of my career. Um, and then you kind of think every job you do, you think, and maybe there'll never be another job. And then there is. And before you know it, you turn around and 30 odd years has gone. Wow. Um, about so, your um, uh, theatre company, um, uh, what inspired you to, uh, for that concept? What about it? Well, I have to be honest and say it's not completely my idea. It was the company that I work for. It was it was their, their brainchild. But... Um, um, I kind of grew up thinking that, you know, I come from a normal working class background, um, sort of normal education, went to comprehensive school. Um, I always kind of thought that Shakespeare was just for the educated, for the posh, for the elite, and was not, didn't speak to me at all. Of course, when I really started to investigate the Shakespeare, and I say my, my career's kind of concentrated on it for the last 15 years, um, just all this box of humanity and beauty opened up for me. And uh, I just realized the universality of Shakespeare, that he's speaking to everyone. And Shakespeare really unlocked something in me. And I kind of have maybe a kind of quite evangelical <laughs> view that um, his humanity and his universality can kind of unlock anyone. And it's extraordinary to see um, my group of actors, how they respond to the language. 
And what I always say is it's almost like nobody's ever told them they're rubbish at Shakespeare. So they kind of attack it like a, a wonderful um, new language that they're learning. And it really speaks to them. I mean, these are people who are very isolated, people with depression, people with physical disabilities. So we've just re actually recently done a um, production of Richard III and our, our lead actor um, has cerebral palsy. And um, it was an enormous, extraordinary journey for him. And uh, yeah, so I have a huge belief um, that Shakespeare is for everyone. And, um, you know, the, the, the group, we've been together four and a half years now and it's been really successful. That's great. Uh, James, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? Yes. Um, so from what I understand, you, um, you've had a former career in children's entertainment. You were the host oh, yeah. of, um, you were the host of, um, How dare you bring that up? <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it a sore subject? No, not at all. No, yeah. absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. I'm only joking. It was, um, it was, um, what was it? Uh, F song Factory, was it? Fun Song Factory. Fun Song yeah. Factory, right, that was A that. factory where we made songs. <laughs> it sounds interesting. Um, and I was just wondering, um, so we haven't really, um, talked to many people who've been in like very explicitly um children's entertainment and um a lot of the um the plays um that we've been performing as students as well uh, they also do tend to be more on the uh mature end of things um so i was just wondering like um what's it like um just yeah what's what's it like just being in um you know an explicitly ch um, um working specifically in an entertainment field for children and how does it differ Perhaps in terms of production and behind the scenes to other, to other like yes, I mature um, quote unquote. The, uh, yeah, there's quite a lot to unpack there in that question. And um, what I would say is that any any sort of performance is telling a story. Um, and what's important, your job as an actor is to deliver that um, story with as much clarity as possible um, and much as much honesty as possible. So I guess um, Fun Song Factory was for preschool children to teach the very, very basics, like kind of colors and numbers. And, um, and it was a great exercise in, in being clear as a performer because you have to be so very laser clear with children. And I also did a huge amount of panto as well. Mm -hmm. So that was a really amazing sort of um, it's, I played, I used to play the principal boys and then I went on to, you know, got promoted to the baddies. And of course you always have an extraordinary relationship with the audience. You know, you're always breaking the fourth wall. You're always talking and integrating with the audience. And I think they were great, enormous learning curves for me as a performer. When I came to do the more kind of highbrow Shakespeare's and the kind of Shakespearean baddies, I had a real sense of conversation with the audience. So I would say that, that that experience of children's TV and also children's stage work was invaluable to me as a performer. How is it different? Backstage, production wise, it's no different at all really. I mean, everyone is as equally talented if not more than they are in kind of other sort of TV production companies. I mean, it really, I mean, it's, it's a great gift to be able to um, deliver really good children's TV and children's performance. It's a great talent. And I worked with some amazing, I mean, I worked with the people who created the tweenies um, in Lachlan and Will Brenton. So, I mean, they were actually totally at the top of their game. Yeah, but back, but back, yeah. Does that that's cool, a very valuable, um like learning experience definitely massive yeah because at the end of the day all we're doing is telling a story mm. and that story has to be clear and um yeah it was a great way to craft that yeah no oh, thank you that was very insightful thank, thank you. you oh good thank you yeah. um though kind of related to that um you mentioned that you've had quite a bit of experience in terms of like theater um not only theater but also tv and film as well um, and I was just wondering, could you give insight and perhaps um, the differences you found between like d the different mediums or the differences between them in working in them and perhaps which one you prefer overall? Well, I can tell you, um, I was doing a lot of TV uh, when I was in my late, uh, late 20s. I was in a series for two years called London's Burning. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, I did. It got to a point where I, I suppose it was to do with the writing. Um, the writing was appalling <laughs> and I was playing a really stereotypical character. I mean, this is the late 90s, yeah. but I was playing a kind of barmaid. Um, and um, it was just really rotten, shoddy writing. And I think I was sort of halfway through the second series and I thought, why am I doing this? This isn't why, yeah, I've, you know, I've got some nice money in the bank, but why am I doing this? This isn't what I went into this profession, this industry for. I went into this industry because I love words and I love plays and I love a relationship with an audience. So for me, I find, in fact, I've just recently done a little bit of a TV I've just played a, a couple of an episode of Casualty I've just recorded, and um, it was interesting to go back to it after so many years. And I think what it is is that I find it quite clinical. I mean, for me, there's nothing, and and also, you know, you go out on stage, you play that enormous, wonderful arc of a character for two, maybe two and a half hours, non-stop. You sort of you throw yourself into that that person's that character's world and you have this extraordinary relationship with an audience and that's why I do it that's why I did it that's why I want to do it and tv and film have never satisfied me in the same way um but not all actors are like that I mean I've got plenty of peers who are just like I don't do stage anymore it's too much hard work it's not well paid enough um but that's why I went into this industry. So, yeah. So, um, it's very clearly <laughs> saying that you prefer theatre um, overall. You'd say. Yes, I've already lost a thousand jobs by saying that, but <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, no, no. I definitely do um, understand that, um, especially with um, the context of you, um, like essentially like going on a journey with that character over two and a half or so hours, whereas yeah. um, we haven't had much. Um, much experience behind a camera but even so I'll, I will admit like the idea of like an all constant um stopping and taking and shooting scenes out of order I'll admit the idea does seem a little bit foreign to me perhaps that's because I just haven't done it really yes but um yeah I will admit I will admit on paper at least um in terms of like creativity and just being like becoming like one with a character in a sense theater does sound more appealing I'll, I'll admit yeah that. Yeah. And I think what you, you know, you rehearse, you rehearse for three or four weeks and gosh, and sometimes at the Royal Shakespeare Company, we were rehearsing for seven or eight weeks. And what, and um, rehearsals are wonderful. I like, I prefer rehearsals now, I think more than I prefer performing because, um, you know, all the investigation of the script, the detective work, all, all the all the questions and the answers that working on a text throws up. Um, that's what I love. And I guess that's really missing in most, well, certainly with the TV I've done. And the camaraderie of being in a, a company is very, very different as well, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Tabia, you had a question, didn't you? Yes, um, I was wondering, what's your experience with the Royal Shakespeare Company and how did the opportunity arise? Um, how did it come about? Well, this is quite a spooky story, actually. Um, so my, I was really, really lucky at the RSC. I was there for, for initially for two very long contracts. I was doing the histories for two and a half years and then I did another block of plays for another two and a half years. And what was great about being there for that long was you could really reflect on your craft, had loads of tech sessions, voice classes, I mean, history classes, um, rhetoric classes. You know, Shamra Chakrabarti would come and talk to us about tyranny. You know, it was just incredible, incredible time. Um, And how did it come about? Um, I was unemployed probably for one of the longest periods in my life, which luckily, I mean, it sounds terrible, it was probably about eight months. But I was also a single parent. So I had a small child on my hands and I had no money. I was on the dole. And I was like, I just can't sustain this any longer. So I was going to retrain to be a paramedic. 
So I was due to start at Coventry University in the September on a paramedical science course. Um, I was in the, um, I had my partner at the time, not my son's father, but he asked me, you know, what would you go back to acting for? And I said, well, it would have to be the RSC. Hmm. And he said, what part would you really, really, really like to play? And I went, oh, Joan of Arc. I'd really love to play Joan of Arc at some point in my life. And I didn't even mean the Shakespearean Joan of Arc. And um, I was in the doll queue and my agent called me and she said, the RSC want to see you for Joan of Arc. Isn't that spooky? It is. I it was is. literally in the doll queue no, to, to collect my uh, social security. So, so that's how it happened, like literally out of the blue. And it wasn't like my partner had any influence. Like he wasn't like some great he was just No, he was in the army. So it wasn't like he was just literally asking. He wasn't influential. Um, wow. So, yeah. It works in odd ways. Doesn't it? I think wonder if it was because I'd sort of shouted it out there. And mm. I didn't even know the history. So I didn't even know Joan of Arc was in Henry the Sixth, part one. So. Um, wow. Um, Spooky, isn't it? The Quiet. links to the uh, question. Did that uh, answer your question, Tabia? Yes, yes, it did. That's really cool. But I was uh, really lucky at the um, Royal Shakespeare Company. I was working for Michael Boyd. I was there when Cicely Berry was still alive. John Barton was still alive. You know these huge legends of Shakespeare and text, and so I had a really great time. And of course, um, it's party, party, party as well. <laughs> so that was really good. Uh, um but yeah also linked to what uh james asked earlier with like are you having so much experience in all you know in all mediums like um theater tv and and film we're also given the task to uh, research like professional standards and professional uh, performing arts etiquette um and since you've uh, experienced like all all, all the, uh, those three i don't know if you could uh enlighten us with some of your experiences in terms of when you um, say etiquette for, for example, we've interviewed, uh, for the other people, for example, when we asked this to Roddy Peters, one of the people that we interviewed, um, he mentioned, it, it, quite, um, it can be quite basic, like, for example, always be, being on time, for example. Oh, yes. And, and like, uh, someone else, uh, Gaynor Stiles, mentioned, like, uh, being kind to people uh, and mm. not, not being, like, rude or, like, a diva or whatever. Well, I suppose I... I suppose it's how you should operate in any industry or any area of your life with politeness and goodness and generosity and kindness and supportiveness. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, the, you know, that industry is full of lovely, wonderful, mm -hmm. kind, generous people. Of course it isn't. I mean, generally, any artist is kind of, they have huge characters and huge personalities. But you, I, I mean, I, maybe I'm speaking primarily for um, stage here, but you work as a team. You know, everyone makes that show happen from the executive producer to the cleaner in the toilet, to the people in front of house, to the people backstage. Um, I think that's the most important thing maybe to remember is that you are part of a team and everybody in that team is important and every part every part of that is equal you know not everyone behaves like that of course they don't I mean I've worked with some horrors in my time mm -hmm. but um you know and always a good thing to remember is whoever you meet on the way up you meet on the way down yeah that's always a good thing to remember um, but, you know, my feeling is that every, you should always be on time. You should always treat people with respect. You should always work hard. Uh, yeah, uh, th th that's uh, actually uh, what, what we were looking for. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, yeah. okay. for enlightening us. Um, but uh, you mentioned uh, earlier in the beginning um, how um, COVID uh, has slowed down uh, a little bit of, uh, of your work. Um, how 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 much so that, that's oh, we wanted some like details on like how covid has um restricted well, you and like so what have you been doing 
So when I did it first hit, I was at Sheffield Crucible and I was doing Coriolanus. So that was cut yeah. short. I was due to go to Romania to play Gloucester in King Lear with um, Flute, Kelly Hunter's Flute Theatre. So that was, that was cancelled. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a little job on a horror film um, but they um, they w- were very, very clear- careful with their social distancing and um, actually the producer had actually done a course in a kind of COVID safe, secure course. So we were well looked after on set on that. But that was kind of when it all went a bit relaxed in, I, when was it, kind of August, September? Yeah, yeah, around that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I was offered to do a lovely little play at Hampstead, which would have started in January, and um, and that's not happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I was going to say, uh, back in uh, um, March 2020, we're also um, doing some Shakespeare. Uh, we're um, doing Macbeth and Taming of the Shrew. Um and oh, we, no. my, that's my favorite <laughs> luckily we're, we managed to do one of each uh we we're mm. supposed to do like two of each or, or something uh, i think it was um a few weeks originally it wasn't even so that was originally um it was it was all it was all changed for us right on the day as well so we came in on monday and like rob said um all right don't worry guys we think it's still going to go ahead based on um you know every everything that's still going on we're going to be able to do all the week's performances we come in the next day Oh, yeah. it's such a shame. It's such a shame. All you know that considered. Rob and I you know that Rob and I did Macbeth together at drama school. Oh. Yeah, he, he mentioned that he's done Macbeth, um, but Yeah, um, so we were we were Mr. and Mrs. M at drama school together. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, James uh, uh, played uh, Macbeth. Um, oh wow, how frustrating for you, James. Yeah, well, uh, all things considered, it's like it's good that we were able to get it done at least once. Um so obviously how is that? That's one heck of a journey, Macbeth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely was. Tells, um, ooh, the arc of that character, it's a really exhausting part, isn't it? It was quite, definitely, um, yeah, definitely, like, at, the, at, at that point, it had definitely been the most, um, like, um, well, I, I don't know if I want to use the word exhausting, but it was de- definitely, like, it was, it was, ooh, it was quite hefty, uh, quite a hefty role and quite a lot of... Um, um, like pressure and it quite, quite a bit of growth on my part as well in order to really play it. Um, but yeah, yeah. yeah it, was a, it was a very rewarding part. Um, but um, again, it's also a shame that I wasn't able to um, play with, play about with it a bit more. But um, yeah, yeah, what I'll a shame. Well, I, I hope that will happen in the future for you, James. Fingers I mean, I, yeah, I really hope so. It's such a fantastic play, Macbeth. It's absolutely my favourite. I mean, it's so, it's so lean and direct and just the right shape. I love it. Yeah, especially um, the way that Rob um, like chose to direct it and um, portray the setting as well. That was also very interesting. Well, how was that? Oh, um, we brought it like very much into like the modern um, era, really. Um, it was like basically like, the entire, all the dialogue was kept the exact same, but the aesthetics were updated to the 21st century. Um, yeah. So that was a very um, interesting way of doing it. Um, the only exception being um, the design of the crown, which uh, to this day, I, I'm still very, very annoyed about. But, um, you know, water yeah. under the bridge. <laughs> um, I just noticed that um, the time has started coming down. So um, yeah. we have like oh, around so that nine minutes, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, so, I mean, just talking about that being in the modern setting. I mean, that's what I find amazing about Shakespeare is you can just lift him and pop him anywhere. It's really mm-hmm. interesting, actually. We big discussion about one problem with modern Shakespeare's is um, messages. Because as a modern audience and watching a modern production, you go, well, why didn't they just call them? Why have they just sent someone with a piece of paper that's not gonna get there in time and everything's gonna go horribly wrong, you know? So that's what you always, that's always a bit of a clangor when you put Shakespeare too far forward. Um, is how, why haven't they got mobiles? Yeah. Sorry, go on. <laughs> um- but for example, in our production of Macbeth, oh, as uh, James said, a lot of things changed in the day. Um, for example, um, uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth uh, uh, couldn't kiss because of like we were like, oh, okay, restrictions and stuff. Yeah, we originally um, had like this whole like it was it was just Rob, me, and her like just like in a room together, like, get, like both of us getting really really okay. like comfortable with like um 
you know, performing and expressing ourselves in this really intimate way. Um, so it was a, it was a bit of like, a bit of, like, oh, a bit of a letdown. Like, you know, like we've gone through, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm used to it now, but we can't even do it. Like, and it was funny because yeah. like, we, we really built up quite a good dynamic, I'd feel. Um, yeah. Regard, like um, our physical, like intimacy. Yeah. Uh, the married couple. So it was a bit disappointing that that, that element of it was kind of lost. Um, that was quite a shame. Yeah. This is very much a new thing, you know, this kind of idea of intimacy direction in any way or being given time to sort of play, you know, be with each other physically and relax. You know, um, it would, we just used to kind of throw ourselves into it before. Mm -hmm. The idea of intimacy, it's a very good thing. It's a very important thing. I wish it had been around in my day. Yeah, but you, you did say that you, um, since COVID hit, you've done some a uh, uh, few uh, projects. But uh, how has uh, those like restrictions uh, perhaps damaged your uh, uh, either uh, maybe perhaps your performance or how comfortable you were doing whatever you um, do? I don't know. I think I, I'm very lucky in the fact that I've got 30 years behind me. So I've got 30 years of experience behind me. I've also got 30 years of contacts behind me. The people I feel very most sorry for are the people who are either just coming out of drama school or just on fledgling in their careers. They're the people that really need our support in the, in, in the industry. And then, but people like me, we've already been lucky. You know, we've already, I've had a good stint. Um, I want, sometimes wonder that maybe my voice won't be able to fill the Olivier Theatre these days I'm a bit worried sometimes that maybe my muscles my vocal muscles are a bit weaker but to be honest when I was at the National in the Olivier um we were using microphones mm. so um you know I don't know how much the voice is going to be an essential tool of the actor anymore because I don't know if we're going to be performing in these huge spaces anymore that would be a shame if, if but yeah yeah because uh, that's i think that that's kind of the dream too uh for anyone to from like in the um a yeah, big stage that, that's all people. part of the almost part of the all aesthetic isn't it the, yeah um, yeah yeah it would, be, it would be a massive shame to lose that um I know it's only got <laughs> we've only got uh, a few minutes left so let's try and get oh okay gosh know. it's all right no it's all right it's all right um, so a lot of us right now are sending off our like uh, our auditions to um, like universities and drama schools. Um, any advice that you have to give? When you say to... sending off your auditions, are you self taping? Yeah, we're self taping. Yeah, um, I don't know how often you've you've done that um, in your career, um, but talking in terms of um, general audition advice, do you have anything um, to give to anyone who might be watching? Or even always concentrate on the work not the job mm. concentrate on the work always always give because actually if you're focused on the work you always absolutely be absolutely prepared never ever think I mean I've gone into so many situations where I thought oh I kind of I know the lines ish I know it I think I know it I mean but you know it, that's the trouble when you're um, you know, I suppose you're not because you're sending your tapes, so that's slightly different, isn't it? Do you have interviews with them? Um, Do you have so like Zoom interviews? Do you know, for, expense, for like, um, like sec if we reach like second round auditions, then um, that usually happens at that point. And that would just be an interview? Uh, yeah. Um, you wouldn't have to perform within the Zoom audition? I think would. Um, certain ones, certain schools do. I remember last hmm. year, uh, in particular, Guildford um, uh, okay. had us perform that as well. Yeah, so I guess the thing is, I think what the concentrating on the work really anchors you in the audition. It really, and I find it um, really helps the nerves as well. If you, you know, for example, I will, and I do it before a press night as well, um, because, you know, press nights are so nerve wracking and all that work you've done in six weeks can just suddenly disappear because you're just so scared um, is I give myself something to achieve within the performance that night. Um, um, so you concentrate on that rather than going, oh my God, the reviewer from the Times is in the front row, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, I think always if you concentrate on the work rather than the job or 
yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we we'll got what you're trying to say. Thank you very much. Um, I think that might be it, unless I'm missing something. Is anyone else? Uh, yeah, but, and uh, it's better to uh, perhaps finish soon instead of being interrupted yeah. <laughs> afterwards. But, uh, between well, I, would, the sorry, I would say as well about Zoom auditions. I mean, I guess you, you get some sort of training in that, don't you? I mean, where to place your eye line, how to frame yourself. Um, uh, I mean, not not really. We we're now investing in you know, stuff like tripods and and things, yeah. so we can place like our, our phones and um, yeah. If you're uh, going to spend money, spend it on stuff like that now. Tripods, lighting, um, because you know that is the way everything is going at the moment. So you you need to become real experts at self taping and zooming. Yeah. Um. Um. You know and. You know, I know it's difficult to live in kind. It's really difficult if you live in small places or whatever. I'm constantly trying to find a bare wall, you know, to work up yeah. against. But some, um, you know, really become experts at self taping and filming yourself. And actually, um, because I had had a year of sort of doing self tapes and working more on Zoom and stuff. Actually, when it came to film casualty this time, I was a little bit less nervous because. I have been sat in front of a camera for a year. Yeah. yeah. Silver lining, I suppose. Yeah. Well, um, before uh, the timer uh, goes on, and thank you so much for being so That's all right. collaborative no worries, and uh, taking uh, some of your time. I don't know if there's anything that you'd like to promote, or either social media or anything that you're working on. No, no. Well, I obviously would like to promote the company I work for, Ego Performance Company. Here, amazing in Coventry. Um, I'd like to promote those, obviously. But I think but what I wanted to say to you is that, you know, people who are my stage in the industry are there for you. Mm -hmm. You know, we really want to help you. We're really worried about you sort of launching into this industry in these times and never be frightened to ask for help because people like me are gagging to help you because we're worried. So never ever be, always reach out, always ask because the help is there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very and, much for, and, yeah. And hopefully we get to work with you one day. <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> Let's Maybe hope. actually in person, who yeah. knows? <laughs> when, when Rob asked me to be in your production of Macbeth,